The text for our sermon this Quinquagesima Sunday is from Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 1 through 15. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word. And say, hear the word of the Lord, all you men of Judah, who enter these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly execute justice with one another, you do not oppress the sojourner, the fatherless, or the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own harm, then I will let you dwell in this place, in this land, that I gave of old to your fathers forever. Behold, you trust in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered, only to go on doing all these abominations? Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. Go now to my place that was in Shiloh, where I made my name dwell at first, and see what I did to it because of the evil of my people Israel. And now, because you have done all these things, declares the Lord, and when I spoke to you persistently, you did not listen, and when I called you, you did not answer. Therefore, I will do to the house that is called by my name, and in which you trust, and to the place that I gave to you and to your fathers, as I did to Shiloh, and I will cast you out of my sight, as I cast out all of your kinsmen, all the offspring of Ephraim. Here ends our reading. Let us pray. O oh Lord, you have revealed your name to us so that we might know you, so that we would put our hope in you, and so that we would indeed call on you. Help us not to trust in false words, in deceiving words, but to trust in your holy word so that we would live according to your will that you have revealed to us in that word. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. In the book of Jeremiah, the Lord sent the prophet to preach at the temple gate. Don't trust in these deceitful words that claim, this is the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Since the Lord had protected the city in previous times, the people came to think that the Lord would never allow Jerusalem to be destroyed or the temple to suffer sacrilege. They acted as if the temple was a talisman, 
And so through Jeremiah, the Lord spoke to the people that the temple would be destroyed if it refused to repent. And he took Shiloh as an example. Shiloh was the place that Joshua had placed the tabernacle when the people entered into the Promised Land. When the Assyrians destroyed the northern tribes of Israel, there was nothing left at Shiloh. He says, go, check it out. See what I did to those people. I will treat my temple in the same way. This place where my name is, is linked to this building, this place that you're trusting in, in the same way that I treated Shiloh, I will chase you from me. Just the way that I scattered your brothers. The Lord let the people know not to put their confidence in the temple, but in him who was to be worshipped at the temple, in him who was able to be their savior and deliver them. During my short stay in Haiti a number of years ago, I was surprised by the number of businesses that call on the name of the Lord on their signage in their name, thinking that doing so would bring God's blessing on them. There was a, a small uh, spice place called the Lord's uh, Deliverance. There was a bazaar called O oh Christ. And there was uh, a drink bar called Trinity Bar. Trinity bar. God is generous, full of mercy and goodness towards his people, but he doesn't guarantee any financial success, even if you uh, plaster his name on your business. In calling on the name of the Lord in this way, what these business owners are doing is they're trying to make God bless their business. And again, when I was in Haiti, people call on the name of the Lord to be their protector, to deliver them from evil spirits. One night when we were at the guest house, it was about, I think, 10 or 11 o'clock at night, the neighbor of uh, the place we were staying cried out, Jesus is my Lord. And he told the devil, you have no right here to draw near to my home. But he didn't just say it once. He went on for an hour, threatening the devil, telling him that God was protecting his place, and that the devil was going to be eternally condemned. Now, that is true. The name of the Lord, the name of Jesus, is powerful. And when confronted by the devil, you should call on the name of the Lord. But I tend to doubt that the devil was actually being held back that night by what that man was doing. You see, the name of the Lord is not a talisman, a lucky rabbit's foot that you can pull out when you need it. You cannot manipulate God. No, present your requests to God. But know that Jesus has also taught you to pray, let your will be done. And you see, praying in this manner, you are entrusting yourself to the Lord. That he will do for you what is best for you. Superstitions exist and they persist. How many people cross their fingers, touch wood, hang uh, a horse's, uh, uh, a horseshoe above their door? How many people wear a St. Christopher medallion or call on St. Christopher before they begin a long trip? A lot of people will light candles, hoping that it might help those who are deceased. Or how many other people wear a cross thinking that the cross will protect them? It's not a bad thing to wear a cross. It's a good thing. I wear one. But there's the problem that was going on in Jerusalem as the people were saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. They were treating the temple like a good luck charm, the way so many people do as they wear a cross. These useless religious appearing gestures 
don't actually accomplish anything. What God calls us to do is to live according to his word and to trust in him. Trust the Lord who loves you, who has baptized you so that you would belong to him. He has saved you already from the power of the devil. Call on his name if you are afraid. If there is an evil spirit that truly is harassing you or in any other situation, Call on his name. But don't treat it as if it's a magic formula. Otherwise, you risk what happened to the sons of Siva. In case you don't know this history in the book of Acts, let me tell you. Siva was one of the chief priests of the Jewish people. His sons were exorcists. One day, they realized that the disciples of Jesus had been casting out demons in the name of Christ, and they decided that they would try and do the same thing. And so, they did so. And the evil spirit responded to them, I know Jesus, and I know who Paul is, but you? Who are you? And this man who was demon-possessed, he threw himself on them. He conquered them all in such a way that they fled from the place where this man was. They fled naked and injured. The Lord, in his goodness, gives you his name so that you can call on him. He has put his name on you when you were baptized. Now, some people think about their baptism in the same way that the people of Israel were thinking about the temple, like a talisman. They saw no need of their baptism. They looked at their baptism the same way as they saw the temple and said, well, it's kind of like an insurance contract. I signed it. I do what I need to do. The company keeps uh, taking the money out of my account, and there's no need to think about it anymore. Such a person might say, I'm baptized, so as to say, I've done what I need to do to be saved. I don't need God anymore. I meet the minimum requirements. How many people will be sad on the last day and will complain when Jesus says to them, I tell you the truth. I do not know you. Salvation isn't an impersonal contract with God. God gives you his name. He makes you his beloved, dear, precious children. The temple was important in the Old Testament because God had promised that his name would be there, that the people could draw near to God at that place. Through holy baptism, God promises to dwell with you, to give you the Holy Spirit. But in the same way that the people of Jerusalem didn't actually appreciate what the temple was, Christians can despise their baptism and think that it's nothing. Dear Christians, say, I am baptized. And rejoice in the gift that God has given you in your baptism. Say, I am baptized. And know that you have been buried with Christ and raised to a new life in him. Those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified their sinful nature with its passions and desires we read in Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. Christ has died for you. You are forgiven by Jesus. Being baptized is not a free pass to continue on in sin or so that you can reject God and become indifferent to him who comes near to you. No, your baptism gives you access to him so that you should 
draw near to him, him who is the source of your life. But it's more than just about superstition when the people of Judah said, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. It was idolatry, plain and simple. The people rejected the word of God for what appeared religious. God will not be mocked. That's why the Lord said to the people not to trust in these deceitful words. Which causes us to ask, what is the true word? It's what Jeremiah was saying to them. Amend your sinful ways. Your sinful way of acting. God corrects those that he loves. In the same way that a a good and decent father will help direct his children in the bond, in, in, in the good path, on the right way of living, when they get off the off the road. As for the religious unfaithful leaders, they told the people of Israel that they had nothing to fear that God was going to love them no matter what, and always, no matter what they did, that he was going to accept whatever they did. And the people exploited the vulnerable. They killed innocent people. They served Baal and other false gods. They stole, committed adultery, lied. And then they came to God. They came to the temple to say, Ah, we've been delivered. They were transforming this, transforming this holy place of God into a den of thieves. And God answered, no. No, he wasn't going to tolerate their unrighteousness and their injustice. And it's the same today. There are religious leaders who despise the law of God and say to people what they want to hear. How long do you think God will allow that to continue. How long will he let these liars keep on lying and deceiving people? God is not a lucky charm. The Lord is living. Jesus died for the sins of the world. He suffered to pay for your sins. Why? So that you might die in your sins? No so that you would live. Because you have died to your sins and been raised to new life in Christ. That's why Jeremiah is telling the people, there is a way out. There's a way to be saved. He wasn't just telling them to repent, but he was directing them back to the Lord, to the one who could and would offer a solution a real salvation if they would accept him. He allowed those who rejected him to be conquered. And yet he remained faithful to this people. He sent them the Savior. In the gospel lesson that was read for today, Jesus asks the question, can a blind man direct another blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? Wide and spacious is the way that leads to destruction. And many will enter by that way. Jesus is not blind. He sees clearly. He knows your sins, and he calls you not to be indifferent to your sin, not to continue in your sin. Are you taking advantage of people? Stop it! Are you stealing? Don't keep doing that. Are you committing adultery? Repent, change your way. Are you lying and bearing false witness about people? Be people of the truth. The unfaithful religious leaders today will lie to you and will offer you a dead idol, giving you a false comfort. They are blind, and they will say, don't worry. Don't be anxious by your sins. God accepts you, no matter what. He doesn't expect anything else of you. 
if you listen to them, you will fall in that pit with them. Don't trust these lying words. Amend your sinful ways. The unrighteous way of acting. No, see your sin. And know that that merits death. And left to yourself, you would die eternally. But look to Jesus Christ crucified for you. He died in your place to pay the price for your sins. See the horror of him, of what happened to him to save you. See Jesus, the innocent one, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then know that he has conquered death. He went out of the tomb victorious. Look to the risen Savior and you can say, yes, we have been delivered. That is the truth. Not in a good luck charm, but in the one who has risen from the dead and who lives to give you life. It's not a, a good luck charm saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Jesus is the temple of the Lord. And on the last day when he raises you again, you will dwell with him in security and in safety because you truly have in your God, in Jesus, the temple of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds steadfast in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.